Julia Sweeney. She's uh, an actress, comedian, uh, I guess a regular on uh, Saturday Night Live, which I don't watch, but uh, apparently she wrote a book in uh, 2005 called Letting Go of God. And then uh, a man named David uh, Ian Miller interviewed her uh, sometime after that to ask her a couple things about the book. A couple of her comments are are interesting as it pertains to our, our message this morning in terms of Jesus' concern about kids, about children, and how things we say to them, uh, how we treat them can really uh, impact them for or against the kingdom of God, and that those that do that will, will be held uh, very much in accountability. Uh, but he asked, uh, how do you relate to people who strongly believe in God? And she she re uh, replied, when he replied, if someone has credible evidence that there is a supernatural power that knows what I think and cares about me and offers me life after death, I would uh, look at that evidence with an open mind. On the other hand, I can't imagine that there would be that evidence. So it's too bad. Maybe we need to keep praying that somebody get the evidence. There is evidence that they would get the evidence uh, to her. And, uh, and then Miller followed that with a question about her daughter, and, she, and, uh, and uh, he asked, uh, what do you tell her about God? And uh, this pertains to our, our message this morning. She responded, I say God is the idea of a big man who lives up in the clouds, and he created everything. And she goes, well, I believe that. And I go, well, yeah, but it sounds like a cartoon character. But the truth isn't that. I'll tell you the truth. And then I actually teach her about evolution. And she asks me about it all the time as a bedtime story. She'll say, tell me about how the dinosaurs weren't here when people were here. And then I'll go over it again. I don't know how much of it she really gets, but she likes the story. Uh, and, and then she's kind of over it now, but she would go, I believe in God at school, but when I come home, I don't. And then Miller closes the interview with a question concerning her daughter's future and her religious choices, uh, and she says, in terms of what she might choose, uh, and whatever she decides to do, that'll be okay with you? And she says, yeah. I can't say I'd be thrilled if she joined a church. I mean, unless she was so messed up that the church actually helped her out. <laughs> okay, great mom. Uh, but, I, I, you know, that, that is the view of so many people, you know, around the world today, you know, without Christ and really blinded to God's mercy and, and grace. But Jesus has some very uh, important things to say about children, our care, our concern, and our, our perspective about them, and, and then is going to use one of them as an example of a, a quality that needs to be there at the uh, point of salvation. Uh, verses 1 to 4 speak about the fact that the disciples themselves must change to enter the kingdom. It says, at that time the disciples came to Jesus and asked, who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? He called a little child and had him stand among them, and he said, I tell you the truth, unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Somebody has said about humility that true humility is, is not thinking uh, merely of, of oneself. Uh, it's not thinking of oneself at all. <laughs> and uh, I think we all probably, uh, everybody struggles with this idea, this characteristic of humility, true humility. It's uh, very difficult. Of course, by the time we feel like we've really conquered it, we're very proud of the fact that we have and we no longer have it. So it can be a, a real problem. But the disciples, again, must change. First, we'd say they must change their position of pride because certainly they had it arguing over who is greatest in the kingdom. Now, 
Uh, verse 1 says, at that time. So what was going on at that time? Well, at that time, uh, Peter had just uh, had a conversation being confronted with a person that went around collecting the temple tax once a year. Remember from our study a couple of weeks ago. Uh, and so he goes inside the house and, uh, and then Jesus, knowing what's going on, uh, has this whole conversation about paying the temple tax and how we need to do that in order not to stumble others. We don't really necessarily have to do it. I'm the king. You're my son. You know, kids don't have to pay the, uh, the tax in a kingdom and so forth, but just so that we don't stumble them. Go out to the Sea of Galilee, throw out a line, uh, take the first fish you catch, open its mouth, and you'll pull out a, pull out a coin uh, that is, uh, will be enough to pay your tax and mine. And, uh, and of course, apparently that all happens. And the other 11 guys are going, how come he didn't ask me? <laughs> it's at that time. At that time, uh, you know, Peter, James, and John have gone up on the mountain. Uh, they've been kind of singled out. and They get to see what we call the transformation, uh, transfiguration uh, of Jesus and so forth. So it's, it's during the time. Who's the greatest in the kingdom? In a sense, they're, what they're asking for is among us, Guys right here, us 12 that are following you, among us, which one is the greatest in the kingdom? Because it sure better not be Peter. <laughs> it's kind of the, uh, the, uh, the implication here. And we, you know, we kind of get a kick out of these guys following them along and some of the stuff they do and the stunts they pull and the things that they say to Jesus. And, and sometimes we are amazed at his patience and sometimes we understand his stern rebukes of them. Uh, but this is a question that these guys went over uh, over and over again. Uh, if you think about the fact that the way that they sat at a table, it was called a Roman triclinium, and it was like in a shape that not Leonardo da Vinci didn't quite have it. It wasn't a straight table, and they're all sitting at chairs <laughs> like the painting. It was, uh, it was kind of in a, a, a bit of a triangle, and you had the, uh, uh, the, uh, the host, you know, the, uh, the honored guest, and so forth, and it was like a pecking order all the, all the way down. So, you know, whoever was highest ranking among them, you know, sat up here. So every time they sat down to eat dinner, it was probably a fight as to who got to sit furthest, you know, closest to Jesus and, uh, uh, and so forth. We've got a comical situation in a sense in Matthew 20. If you want to turn over just a couple of pages to your right, Matthew 20, 28, just to show you a couple other verses, this argument does not go away uh, after our incident here with Jesus in Matthew 18. In Matthew 20, it says, And the mother of the Zebedee sons, James and John, came to Jesus with her sons, kneeling down, asked him a favor. It's got a little, just a little favor, Jesus. Uh, what is it you want, he asked. She said, Grant that one of these two sons of mine may sit at your right and the other at your left in your kingdom. You don't know what you're asking, Jesus said to them. Can you drink the cup I'm going to drink? We can, they answered. We're can-do guys. No problem. I mean, they have no idea what they're saying. Uh, the cup he's going to drink is talking about the cup of his suffering and his death, of course. 23, uh, Jesus said to them, You will indeed drink from my cup, but to sit at my right or my left is not for me to grant. These places belong to those for whom they have been prepared by my Father. When the ten heard about this, they were indignant. And the, and the Greek is very, uh, uh, very strong there. I mean, they were really, really ticked off. They were indignant with the two brothers. Jesus called them together and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lorded over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant and whoever wants to be first must be your slave, just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. So again, on, ongoing conversation, fighting about it every time they sit down to eat dinner in any kind of a formal occasion, uh, who is the greatest? And, you know, it does speak to the fact that they believe Jesus was the Messiah and he was going to come into his kingdom. If they didn't have the faith to believe that, they're not, they're not asking the question. So that's kind of a good thing in a sense. Uh, but again, uh, concerned about them themselves. Uh, the fact that Jesus had been sharing with them about his upcoming suffering, his death, <laughs> apparently had no effect over them uh, at all. And, uh, and that's what pride does. 
really blinds us, you know, to the realities around us, blinds us to spiritual truth. And these guys were so absorbed with each other. It was just a, an ongoing conversation, an ongoing argument. Again, faith is not the issue here. Uh, they believed that Jesus was coming into his kingdom, but uh, it was what position they would have in that kingdom. Uh, this argument, one more reference, because it goes right up until the time that Jesus is about ready to die on the cross. So it, it's ongoing. It goes all the way through. Uh, we see it in Luke 22, 24. There it says, also a dispute arose among them as to which of them was considered to be greatest. And again, this is, this is right up. They're in Jerusalem. Uh, he's hours away from his death on the cross at this point. Verse 26, it says, uh, instead, the greatest among you should be like the youngest and the one who rules like the one who serves. Uh, again, why is, what's the point? Why is this so important? Why is it mentioned over and over again? It is because it is the essence of being a follower of Jesus Christ. It is the essence of being a follower of Jesus Christ. He says it's so important. He uses phrases like, you must become a slave, the lowest, like a child, the servant of all. And he goes on and on. And, and certainly probably the, the best book that we could recommend on the subject would be Gail Irwin's uh, uh, The Servant, you know, about Jesus, the Jesus style, which is the style of, of servanthood. It's so important. If we don't grasp this concept, we will not reflect Christianity to the world as it was meant to be reflected. That's all there is to it. And people and churches that don't get this concept morph Christianity into something Jesus never meant it to be. If, if, in, if it's a church system where the opposite is reflected, if the, if the leadership and the heads of those churches as, are as seen as Jesus said, don't be like the, the Gentile uh, who, who lord over others and so forth. And uh, command respect and command, you know, uh, these kinds of things. If it's, if it's like that, then uh, it's, it's not really reflective of Jesus, his, his style, but more than his style, the, the essence of what his, uh, his whole ministry and his life was, was all about. And, and they do, I mean, obviously those church systems and structures do exist. We're just very thankful that Pastor Chuck has always modeled uh, to us and then via uh, to me personally through Pastor Bill, this idea of, uh, of servanthood and everything. Man, I, I just remember uh, when we bought the, uh, the Empress Theater down there in downtown Honolulu. I mean, and it, was, it was still, I mean, if you don't know, it was really part of the red light district when we bought it. I mean, when we were going down and bought the building and we were checking it out and, and making our plans and how we would utilize the facility and meeting the architects and the engineers down there, from our car to the front door, we would typically get propositioned two or three times before we ever got through the front door. We would go out and sweep up the needles and stuff for guys are shooting up the, the night before uh, and everything. Uh, <laughs> Pastor Bill would be, once we got into the thing uh, and everything, uh, Pastor Bill would be one of the first guys out there on a Saturday morning with his power washer <laughs> going down to, uh, everything uh, to clean up after the people that lived on the street and some of the little cubby holes and alleys and became their bathrooms at night and stuff. I mean, it wasn't, uh, it wasn't the most pleasant work in the world, but he was right in there with us the, the whole time. And the point is, Nobody thought anything of it, and nobody was surprised by it. It's just the way it is. This is what Jesus is talking about. It's you become the, the servant of all. I have to tell you that uh, when, uh, when I was teaching a home fellowship and, and kind of growing in the Lord, and, and uh, Kathy and I could obviously see uh, God changing me because I went from never reading to buying books and reading them and just, you know, this whole change in my kind of appetite for, for learning and, uh, and so forth and, and, and teaching the word. Uh, and then there was a, a point in time where I kind of had this prodding by the Holy Spirit that uh, God was going to, you know, use me in a, in a greater capacity in terms of doing that. And this was all preparation and, and this idea of uh, planning a church and pastoring a church. Of course, I, I thought it was Satan just trying to keep me off track at the time. And, and, uh, and I, I just kept denying that. And I would never say a word to anyone, of course. Uh, and, uh, and then one evening we were at Pastor Bill's home, uh, and, uh, we would, you know, do worship, a little teaching and, uh, with some of the guys and, uh, and our wives and 
kind of uh, lay hands on each other and pray for each other for God's leading. And it was a really great time. The Lord would speak. We'd have prophecies over guys and, and stuff and different things. It was a very exciting time. And uh, so our term came uh, one evening uh, and uh, they wanted to pray for me. And uh, I sat in the middle and uh, kind of the hot seat and Pastor Bill and then Bob, uh, who pastors the church in Kauai, uh, we're there praying for me, and uh, and we're you know just praying you know if God's blessing different things in ministry. We're doing the home fellowship over here, and uh, they were just kind of just waiting on the Lord, and then they both started laughing, like loud laughing, and uh, this wasn't like a weird Holy Spirit thing. They were just laughing, and then uh, so I was like, okay, what's so funny here? <laughs> now that you're praying for me, you didn't bust up laughing praying for anybody else tonight. Uh, and they said, oh, yeah, I. The, the Lord, you know, really spoke to my heart, you know, about your future and, you know, how the Lord's going to use you and stuff. And Bob said, oh, yeah, me too, me too. Well, go ahead, Bob, what, what do you feel like the Lord's uh, saying to Tim tonight? And he's laughing, laughing more, and then he finally can sit out, God's calling you to be a pastor. Ah! <laughs> they just thought that was so funny, you know, both of them, both of them, just belly laughing. They just thought that was so funny um, because they understood the concept if you, if you get called to the position, it means God's calling you to be the servant of all. It's not an exalted deal. It's like an, it's not the, I'm climbing the pyramid to the top. It's a, it's an inverted pyramid. I'm actually sinking lower and lower. You know, I, I'm going to have to have more and more to be responsible for and care for and everything. They just thought that was the funniest thing they ever heard in their life. Great confirmation, right? For, uh, you know, when it talks about Paul, Paul laying hands on Timothy to confirm it, it wasn't, it was probably a little different in my case. But uh, if we move away from this idea of like a child, like the lowest, servant of all, the nature of Jesus, if we don't really exemplify that in our lives, if we don't exemplify that as a church, we've morphed Christianity in, into something that God never meant it to be, never meant it to be. So it's very important because it's the essence of really who we're to be as, as individuals and certainly as a, as a corporate body of believers. Uh, the second thing uh, that happens here, disciples must change and follow the example of, a, of humility. And in this case, uh, then Jesus brings this child and sets them among them and uses him as a Example of true greatness. Now, the, the child, a lot of different words in the Greek that could be used here. The word that he uses uh, is, uh, is more than likely a, a really a toddler, uh, about the size of, of uh, you know, some of the little, little gals running around here that we've got in the, in the fellowship and stuff, like, like Vanessa. It's about probably a, a child about like that. The, the oldest child that uh, this Greek word is ever used of is six. So they have to be less than six, but most often we're talking about a, a toddler. And um, I think there's a couple of reasons why I think that's uh, uh, interesting. But again, the idea that here's the model of, <laughs> of greatness. <laughs> you want to be great in the kingdom of God? You want to enter the kingdom of God? It's all about humility. Uh, and here's my example of humility, a little, a little toddler. We'll talk more about maybe some of the implications of that in a moment. But just to say that's common practice among rabbis of that day, the moms and dad would bring their kids and, and sometimes on specific occasions to have, have them prayed for. And we see that with Jesus very often. And we see that not only in his ministry, but as, as a baby, uh, Mary and Joseph bring him into the temple area and there's Simeon there. And they bring him over and he takes Jesus in his arms and he then prays over him and blesses him and quotes uh, Isaiah uh, in terms of these uh, messianic prophecies uh, over him. So a uh, very common uh, practice and again just such a delight to see the relationship that Jesus has with, with children. And um, <laughs> I, uh, uh, I was, um, as I do uh, about every week, listening to David Hawking and he was saying that uh, he had a guy in in, uh, in seminary, uh, older guy that was one of his teachers, really respected. And, and this guy said, um, while you're out there being raised up in ministry and stuff, and you're, you're looking for guys to model your life after, he says, uh, if, you, if you see somebody there in ministry that uh, does not get along with kids and wants nothing to do with kids, don't follow him. Don't follow him. That is not the nature of Jesus. And uh, we see it not only in this passage, but, uh, but, but many others. I, I just thought it was interesting, interesting uh, insight there. 
Uh, let's go back to this question. How do we enter the kingdom of God? Uh, and some of the things that we've already covered is the basic idea of, of repentance. John the Baptist begins his ministry, repent for the kingdom of uh, God is at hand. Jesus begins, first words he preaches uh, when he begins his ministry, repent for the kingdom of, uh, of God is at hand. Peter on the day of uh, what we call Pentecost preaches, repentance is there. Paul's ministry and so forth. How do we enter the kingdom of God? How are we saved? How do we come to the Lord? Well, uh, certainly repentance is a, is a big part of that. A couple of chapters back in Matthew 9, uh, 13, uh, Jesus says, but go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. For I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. And uh, again, this is one of these unfortunate areas where the NIV leaves that very important word out, but it's in most manuscripts. And if you're like me, you, you write these things in. Uh, calls us to repentance. Again, how do we enter the kingdom of God? Matthew 7, 21. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. So how do we enter? How, how is it that we're actually saved? We're just looking at the words of Jesus. Repentance is a big issue. It's, it's, you don't get there without it. Uh, you have to do the will of the Father. Uh, the will of the Father certainly is to obey the gospel, to believe that Jesus Christ died for our sins, to accept his finished work uh, on the cross. Uh, that passage continues in verse 22, though, with a warning. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. So it's, it's possible for people to think that they're in the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God, and they're not. Uh, it's possible for someone to claim to be a Christian, to make some, quote, profession saying he's a Christian, but really not be a Christian, not be in the kingdom of God. So how do we enter? Well, repentance is, is certainly critical. This issue of obeying the will of uh, the Father in heaven in terms of the gospel is certainly critical. Uh, and then we have our text here, again in verse 3, I tell you the truth, unless you change, that's repentance, and become like little children, uh, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. So what does it mean to become like a little children? Well, he says in verse 4, therefore, because of this, whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. So how do we enter the kingdom of God? Repentance, obedience to the gospel, and humility, and, and humility. Uh, no, nobody that is prideful about what they're doing uh, in terms of salvation is saved. Uh, if they still think it's them and their good works and what they do, or what they think they can achieve, what they think they know, whatever it might be, uh, then Jesus says, we gotta, we've got a real problem here. Uh, what should humility look like? Well, like a little child. We'll talk about maybe some of the characteristics of a child in a moment. But go over to Luke 18, or I think I've got that for you as well. Luke 18, 9, uh, Jesus uh, gives us another illustration of what this looks like. He uses the same kind of language in verse 9 there. To some who were confident in their own righteousness and looked down on everybody else. That's the comment he makes about the Pharisees. It's the comment he's talking about the disciples now who look down on everyone else. Don't be like that, he says. And then he tells them this parable. Verse 10, two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood up and prayed about himself. God, I thank you I'm not like the other men, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week and give a tenth of all I get. But the tax collector stood at a distance. He would not even look up to heaven, but beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. I tell you that this man, rather than the other, went home justified before God. For whoever, for everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. So what's the point of bringing this little toddler uh, and using he or her as an example of humility? Uh, it's see that you do not look down on these little ones, or verse 10. Same thing that he says in verse 9 of, of Luke 18. Humility means you don't look down on others. I'm not as sinful as they are. I mean, I'm thankful the Lord's forgiven me of my sin, but I mean, after all, how much did he have to forgive compared to those guys over there? 
Do you understand that some people think that and say that? I had uh, one of my uh, teachers in, in graduate school uh, that, that I knew ahead of time and stuff, and we, we'd talk uh, often uh, in between class and stuff, and he was telling me that the uh, church he was in previously, which was a pretty good-sized church and everything, but he still felt like they really weren't reaching the community like they could, and uh, he had moved on for that position to, uh, to uh, run the school that I was in, and he was saying that uh, while he was there, it was a, really kind of frustrating because he was constantly, uh, he was very uh, evangelistic minded. He kept thinking of ways that they could reach out to the community and, uh, and, and, and bring people in the church and, and so forth and lead people to Christ. And he'd get all excited and, and, want to, and kind of uh, pitch this to, uh, it was, uh, to uh, the other folks in the, in the church. And, uh, and, and some of them said, well, uh, yeah, but what if we reached some of those people? that might say be homeless or something or, or something like that. What if we, that'd be fine, but what would we do if they ended up coming to church here? I think that's the idea. <laughs> but to them, it's like, didn't have the concept. <laughs> Not like those people, you know, because, you know, our sin isn't like those people. And Jesus says, I'm sorry. If you have that attitude coming in, guess what? You're not in. He says, humility <laughs> is, is, is part of the package. I repent. I believe the gospel. I humble myself before God. Uh, not the Pharisee who says, I'm not like other men, but the man that stood from afar and beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Jesus said, that man went away justified. So, so incredibly uh, important. We need to avoid two extremes when it comes to humility. One is thinking less of yourself than you ought to. Moses, before the burning bush. Moses, go to Pharaoh. Tell him, let my people go. You sure you can't get somebody else? Because I'm not really good at speaking. You know, I don't really do that kind of thing. I mean, that's just a good thing. I realize you're hearing the cry. You're being, hey, there might be people too, but I'm not really the guy. Moses, I'll be with you. You know, well, that's good. That's really good, God, and then everything. And I'm, you know, but you, know, <laughs> you don't understand. You know, let me inform you, God, because you, I'm telling you, you got the wrong. That, that's that's what happened, right? I mean, what I can't believe is that God condescends and say, "All right, bring your brother if you got to bring your brother." You know, and then Aaron, you know, comes along for the show. Of course, he was big help. You know, Aaron, that was a good call on Moses's part, right? But uh, thinking less of yourself. The other extreme, thinking more of yourself uh, than you ought. That's what Paul says in Romans 12, 3. Do not think more highly of yourself than, than you ought. Uh, again, I mentioned it uh, a few weeks ago, but the, the 1 Peter 5, uh, 5, 5, you know, all of you clothe yourself in humility towards one another because God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand that he may raise you up in due time. Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. And, and we could go on. This, this idea of humility is, is just, uh, just critical. I, uh, I did read an article a number of years ago by Michael Card, the uh, singer, song, songwriter, and, and, uh, and author, and uh, made several uh, references to this idea of what was Jesus talking about. And, and I just want to, again, point out, I think it's interesting to read and maybe a little insightful. What, what did Jesus mean by bringing this child? He meant humility, he tells us. What did Jesus mean by, by bringing the child? And what is it about a child, you know, that Jesus was speaking about? Humility, he tells us. It's not, this is not a mystery here. You know, so just, just so we, we got that. But uh, Michael Card writes a couple other things about, about kids that maybe have help us in terms of application. And the first one he says uh, about children is simplicity. All a little child has to do is eat, sleep, and play. It's a simple life. <laughs> and if their basic needs are met, they're usually happy. Uh, and we see the same simplicity in the Lord's Prayer. Jesus tells his disciples to ask only for enough food for one day. And in his gentle rebuke to Martha, he rejected busyness. So that, that's not a bad thing for us to keep in mind. Naivete. Little ones ask innocent questions and readily believe everything their parents say. Uh, their confidence uh, not in the logic of the answer, for they often make no sense to a child's mind, but in the one who gives the answer. Jesus' contemporaries all often perceived him as embarrassingly na naive. 
The Pharisees whispered among themselves, doesn't he know what kind of woman he's touching? Jesus knew. Jesus knew. Uh, but uh, again, the, the naivete to just uh, the innocence uh, uh, of a child. The confidence not in the logic of the answer, but in the one in whom uh, the answer is coming from. Three, living in the present. Children at play have no concept of time. Any mom say amen to that? <laughs> now is all that exists. Jesus was like that in dealing with people. He put seemingly more important things on hold to give his full attention to insignificant individuals. Two human tendencies will keep us from focusing on, on the present. Guilt binds us to the past while our fear forces us into the future. Since we belong to Christ, neither of these should bother us. God has taken care of them both. Guilt, it's gone away. The Bible says we have a clear conscience. Future, it's in the Lord's hands. God's going to take care of us. The fourth thing, reckless confidence. Children have a natural confidence when they feel secure in their parents' love. Uh, when they sense that the love is not conditional. Jesus had so much confidence in his relationship with the Father. He invites us to know God and that same intimacy. So again, great example uh, here to the disciples. They must change if they're going to enter the kingdom of God. And that change is humility like a child. Secondly, there's a concern for children in their faith. And that's in verses 5 to 6. And whoever welcomes a little child like this in my name welcomes me. If anyone causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him to have a large millstone hung around his neck and to be drowned in the depths of the sea. I think we used to joke about, I don't know, Kevin, did we ever joke about presenting people with the millstone award? <laughs> That's not a good thing to get. But, uh, I don't know if they would get it. We could kind of make it out of clay and kind of hang it around their neck kind of a thing. But... Uh, Again, here, here's a couple of things so important. Uh, we are to be concerned about little children. If we welcome a little child in Jesus' name, we are welcoming Jesus. And if that's not enough to get you involved in children's ministry, I, I don't know what it would take. Obviously, the kids are, are very important uh, to God. What a, what a blessed ministry. Uh, as we receive those, those little guys into Sunday school and gals every week or in the nursery, according to Jesus... It's as though we're receiving him. Are we receiving them every week to teach them the word of God in the name of Jesus? Absolutely. Absolutely. And Jesus says, it's just like you're receiving me. So what do we want the best than for those kids, right? I have to tell you, we're just, we're just at the verge. Friday, I'm going through this. I'm studying this, right? I'm contemplating this. And then I finally get on my email the, the rough draft for the lease across the hall for what kind of ministry? The children's ministry. <laughs> and I start going through the numbers. It's like, okay, Lord, I, yeah, you want the best for the kids, all right. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so pray for us uh, in, in that. We're kind of, uh, we don't have a lot of wiggle worm and, and um, it's not a bad deal that they're offering us. Of course, it's never cheap enough as far as I'm concerned. But uh, uh, anyway, we certainly want to do the best we can for, uh, for the kids. I, I want you to all also notice that, that Jesus talks about these children that believe in me. According to Jesus, the, the kids come to faith in him. You know, I, of course, I don't have a problem with that. I've seen them and I've seen your kids come to know the Lord and grow in the Lord. But, you know, there's some traditions where I remember uh, the tradition I grew up in. You, you were a senior in high school. You turned 18 before you could be baptized. Of course, I was, even though I wasn't saved, because that's what all the other seniors did. And so, but, uh, <laughs> you know, but some people have a problem with that. I don't have a problem with the, the God who spoke the universe into creation being able to communicate clearly to a child's mind of his love and his grace and his mercy. Well, I don't think they can understand fully the concepts of, well, I don't think I can either. You know, and that hasn't helped me back so far. You know, I don't even quite grasp God and his, you know, um, omniscience and so forth. But uh, according to this, uh, uh, ministering to the kids is, is super important according to Jesus uh, and especially those he's very concerned about those kids that believe in him that have placed their faith in him uh, and so he talks about that secondly we're to be concerned about the consequences of causing a child to sin 
or turn away from the Lord. Again, our opening illustration, uh, case, case in point. Uh, so again, the child being spoken about here is a believer uh, in Jesus. Uh, and uh, he says it would be better for that person rather than to do that. And the millstones in Israel, I mean, they're, it's like, the, like a car. I mean, it's giant. I mean, it's uh, several people to try to move one or pick one up. So the, again, the hyperbole of having that tied around your neck, being thrown to the depths of the sea. Jesus says, that would be better. That would be better than doing this. What does that mean? That means if you cause one of these children to sin or turn away from the Lord, what's going to happen to you would be worse than that is the idea. But again, it's Jesus is trying to make a point here. This is uh, uh, very critical, very important. Were children really esteemed in that culture? No. No rights, no nothing. Yeah, it's, it's uh, they've come... You know, again, the concern over children, things like child labor laws, those were all brought about by Christians because of this passage. Yeah, you know, our Western culture is, is different because of what Jesus said uh, right here. And, that, and, uh, uh, and it's a horrific thing what's going on around the world for people that don't understand this concept and the way that ch children are treated uh, in many cultures. But again, uh, it's just as serious to cause a believer to stumble or to sin uh, as well, to set a poor example uh, in front of them. And I want to go to a couple of the, the classic passages that deal with it, both of them by the Apostle Paul. One is in Romans 14, 14. Anyone who is in the Lord Jesus, and I'm fully convinced, uh, uh, as, as one who is in the Lord Jesus, I am fully convinced that no food is unclean. A big issue, obviously, Jews and Gentiles, food being offered to, uh, uh, again, in pagan temples. Uh, you got the temple up here, the offerings going on, the animals being slaughtered, whatever it might be. And then whoo, downstairs, hey, good place for a restaurant, uh, a meat market. Re literally, that's the way it was. You could, and it was cheaper. It was cheaper there because they already got some use out of the animal. Uh, not exactly kosher, though. And to some believers, especially if you had a Jewish background, it'd be like, no way, you can't do that. But to the you know, the run-of-the-mill pagan that gets saved, it's like, why? I've been eating at a restaurant for years. Who cares? It's cheap. Uh, so it's, it's kind of an issue uh, in the church. Uh, that's what's going on, but the principle uh, is, is much bigger than that. Verse 15, if your brother is distressed because of what you eat or what you do, uh, you are no longer acting in love. Do not by your eating destroy your brother for whom Christ died. Do not allow what you consider good to be spoken of as evil. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Because anyone who serves Christ in this way is pleasing to God and approved by men. Uh, Paul is very concerned about how we live our life. Our lifestyle can cause other people to fall into sin. Our lifestyle can be a stumbling block that keeps other people out of the kingdom of God. Uh, we're not under any kind of Old Testament legalism or law, so we need to kind of use our conscience in the direction of the Holy Spirit, some of the clear things we have in the New Testament, and really live our lives in humility uh, on behalf of others. Uh, verse 9 of uh, 1 Corinthians 8, Paul again, Be careful, however, that the exercise of your freedom does not become a stumbling block to the weak. For if anyone with a weak conscience sees you... Uh, who have this knowledge, eating in an idol's temple, won't he be emboldened to eat what has been sacrificed to idols? So this weak brother for whom Christ died is destroyed by your knowledge when you sin against your brothers in this way and wound their weak conscience, you sin against Christ. Therefore, if what, causes, if what I eat causes my brother to fall into sin, I will never eat meat again so that I will not cause him to fall. Can we also add what you drink? <laughs> what you do, you know, again, you have the freedom. That's great. Praise the Lord. But is it possible that what you do in your life actually stumbles somebody else? I want to tell you it's possible. How, <laughs> with no, no show of hands. We could all probably go around and say that in our journey to faith in Christ, there were probably people along the way that really helped us in that journey to say, that guy or that gal is the real deal. They're really a Christian. 
I'm not ready yet, but I want to be like them someday. I want to have what they have. I want to have their values. I want to have their lifestyle. I don't think I'm ready, but I see a difference in them. There were probably, hopefully there were people like that for you along the way. There were for me. Uh, unfortunately, there was a lot of others, though, that claimed to be Christians, and I looked at their life and said, <laughs> they're no different than me. I think they have worse morals than I do. In fact, I think it's okay that I continue doing this because after all, they do it. And actually, they were, Paul says, a stumbling block that kept me from, from the gospel. Uh, in fact, I had so many at one point in time, there was enough of those blocks, they could have built a city. It, it, it took me a long time to make my way through them and understand that everybody that says they're a Christian really isn't a Christian. Uh, and there are a lot of Christians that never really grow up in their salvation and actually create problems from others and keep them from getting there. Jesus is very concerned about this when it comes to children. Paul builds it out a little more and says, it's not just the kids we've got to be concerned about. How drastic is it? Well, let's look at the consequences involved here. Verses 7 and 9. Jesus says, Woe to the world because of the things that cause people to sin. Such things must come, but woe to the man through whom they come. If your hand or foot causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life maimed uh, or crippled than to have two hands or two feet and be thrown into eternal fire. And if your eye causes you to sin, gouge it out and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life with one eye than to have two eyes and be thrown into the fire of hell. There's a little warning here about uh, the, the sinfulness of the world that we live in. Hey, that's a given. We live in a fallen world. But it says, man, woe to the man through whom it comes. So there's a, the warning is drastic uh, and has drastic consequences because it has to do with eternity. And of course, he makes these statements, and, and these are classic rabbinical kind of ways of teaching using what we call hyperbole, taking something of real extreme, you know, how does the camel fit through the eye of a needle? You know, I mean, it's take extreme to, to make a point. Jesus is not s suggesting that we all start <coughs> pucking our eyeballs out, cutting our, our wrist off, and so forth. Um, tried to think of some good names for a church like that, but uh, come in and everybody's missing an eye, or, well, these guys are really spiritual here. Let's really take the Bible literally, you know. But again, this is a, a figure of speech, but it's meant to make a point, because it's like, man, that's radical. That's right. It's radical. Sin is a radical thing. And eternity is, is you don't want to miss eternity. If you had to live in bad health your whole life, but live with Jesus forever in heaven, would it be worth it? Absolutely, he says. We need to take our life and our lifestyles uh, very, very seriously. He says our spiritual health is much more important than our physical health. Jesus spoke about hell more than all the other Bible writers combined. And in this case, he may, uses the phrase eternal fire. We have translated in English, and it's really speaking of Gehenna. Again, there, was, there is the term hell that's used in the New Testament, which is a temporary place of, uh, of torment where people that die now without Christ, that is where they go. Not a pleasant place, but that's not the whole deal. At a point in time in the future, they will have to stand before Jesus in what's called the white throne judgment. Now, they're not going to be judged whether they're uh, guilty or innocent. They've already been judged. Jesus said, I did not come into the world to condemn the world of its sins, but to save the world from its sins. Because the world already stands condemned. <laughs> condemned as sinners. They will stand before the white throne judgment. And there they will be sentenced. And that sentence is to be thrown into the lake of fire. Where it, it goes on for all eternity. And again you could say, well I think that was just a metaphor. Well that's okay. If it's a metaphor, that means whatever it represents is worse. The metaphor is you, you kind of dial it back a little to help us understand. So where do you think it's a literal fire? But the Bible says where the worm does not die. So it goes on for all eternity. Um, again, Jesus talks about this, writes about this more than all the other Bible writers in the New Testament combined together. Very serious subject. So very concerned about 
entering the kingdom of heaven, humility like a child. Very concerned the disciples themselves change and they, they kind of get the, the concept. Very concerned about children, their faith, uh, those that minister to them. And man, what a radical warning if you stumble one of these, one of these little ones. So uh, very, very clear from Jesus. Let's go on. And uh, again, very important as Matthew groups this information together topically for us that we see this last illustration. For our Heavenly Father cares for each of us. So he goes on and says in verse 10, See that you do not look down on one of these little ones, for I tell you that their angels in heaven always see the face of my Father in heaven. And again, verse 11, which should be in your Bibles, but in the NIV, it's in an asterisk and it's at the bottom of the page. But don't believe what they tell you when they say it is not in most of the ancient manuscripts. It's in every manuscript except two, and it should be there. Very important verse, verse 11. For the Son of Man came to save what was lost. What do you think? If a man owns a hundred sheep and one of them wanders away, will he not leave 99 on the hills and go to look for the one that wandered off? And if he finds it, I tell you the truth, he is happier about the one sheep than about the 99 that did not wander off. In the same way, your father in heaven is not willing that any of these little ones should be lost. So a couple things that are obvious here. Uh, the care of the father, again, is seen in guardian angels. Each child has an angel whose face is always before uh, the father. Does that mean that they have a guardian angel? Yes, that's what that means. Yeah, I think maybe kids have a guardian angel. Yes, that's what that means. <laughs> it's, uh, I just crack up reading the commentators, you know, going through this sometimes this week. It's been suggested that children have guardian. It's not suggested. That's what he says. Each one of them has an angel. Is it guarding them? I think that's the point. Is it okay to call them guardian angels? Take your pick. But, uh, man, I just hope they stay with us through adulthood. That's all I got to say. <laughs> I think mine's been sleeping once in a while or something. But, uh, uh, but we could all say, I know that there were times where God intervened. Man, I was ready to pull in that lane, and, and I, just, I just, something told me not to, and I, oh, boom, this truck went flying by. Uh, you know, and that's like three or four times a day for me. Not, re not really, but we've had those experiences uh, where God is watching. God cares about this. He, how much? He sent his son to seek and save that which is lost. Why? Because if we don't get saved, we're going to hell. That's what he said. So, so there's these two extremes, and I'm going to try to close here with an illustration of, of my own in a moment, but, but it's very interesting I mean, to me when Jesus is presenting this the, his concern over what happens to people for all eternity. And his concern is, please don't go there because I'm coming, I'm seeking. Uh, uh, there's guardian angels for you as, as kids watching over you. Uh, Psalm 91 says, for he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. They will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Hebrews 1.14 says, Are not all angels ministering spirits sent to serve those who will inherit salvation? Uh, again, I know that there is some unbiblical teaching out there and the new age thing about angels and so forth. And uh, we're not to be praying to them, talking to them or anything else. We just pray to God, trust him, let him direct the troops. You know, we don't need to, we're the private on the ground. We don't need to be telling the general what to do with, uh, with the, uh, you know, heavy artillery here. You know, we just, you know, we pray, Lord, watch over, protect us. Let him direct what's going on. But nonetheless, um, uh, if we had more time, I could tell you some great, my dad's got, got a, a great story <laughs> about God intervening with uh, what he believes is really an angel and uh, stuck in the mountains in the snow and it's piling up like that. And man, a guy appears out of nowhere and uh, tells him, what's your problem? He says, oh, my car won't start. He says, Try it again. And they've been there for like three hours, right? Try it again. <laughs> Starts right up. He says, you probably never need change. You got chains? Yeah, they're in the back. All right, pop your trunk. It's like, like five minutes later, they're on. You can drive ahead. Are you sure it's okay? He says, you're okay. Drive ahead. And it, okay, Dr pulls out, rear view mirror. No one's there. Do, 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 do. <laughs> then, then he drives up to... Uh, uh, you know, you know, he's, you know, still there up in Tahoe in the mountains and he, he pulls over and uh, the next service station that's, uh, you know, comes available, pulls in there 
uh, to try to check the chains that were put on that uh, if you, you don't have to do that in Hawaii. I can tell you, it's a hassle. <laughs> it's a hassle. It doesn't always go so smooth. And uh, he pulls over. There they are. And he checks his car. Everything seems to be fine. Out of nowhere, guy shows up again. Oh, hey, sir, you're, you're fine. You can drive on. I told you your car is okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Oh, gone again. Do, 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 do. You know, and they drive on. There was a few people praying for him at the time, too, because we knew they were stuck. They were way overdue, hours overdue. A storm had come in. And uh, uh, anyway, the angels are out there, you know. And, and one of the writers, the uh, Hebrew, says, you know, we can even entertain angels un, un, unaware. And um, so what a glorious thing that, that there's this horrific thing in terms of hell and all eternity. But with that, in the same context, Jesus says, but, but God cares. And he's got his angels. And uh, see these little kids that, that believe in me? Man, anybody that stumbles one of them, there's a deep place in hell for them. Uh, there's some heavy punishment that's going to go down for them. Very important. And then he cares about our lifestyle and how we live before others. Uh, and then this whole part of then this illustration that he closes with uh, of a lost sheep. A man owns a hundred sheep. One of them wanders away. <laughs> Hey, 99% is pretty good in terms of the profits. No, this, this shepherd is different. He leaves, leaves everything and he goes out and searches until he finds that one. Uh, and then he, he brings it back. This is an illustration of God's love and his care for, for us. And Jesus says, just humble yourself. Just humble yourself. Come into the kingdom. That's, that's who's going to be the greatest in the kingdom. <laughs> Remember the context. <laughs> it's these guys that he's trying to teach and train these 12 guys. Uh, and, you know, one thing's become obvious, you know, he picked the 12 biggest losers he could get his hands on, you know, because he's going to use them and transform them, you know, after his death and resurrection with the power of his spirit uh, in order to, to turn the world upside down. You know, so, I mean, the, the people that knew these guys had to be totally amazed, you know, at what you know, what became of them and, uh, uh, and so forth uh, afterwards. But in the midst of trying to work with them, he's trying to share his own heart, the heart of a shepherd. Uh, this illustration I wanted to close with was uh, from a, a story that's probably been told a few times, and I, I did get some verification. It's, it's a, a true story. Uh, and it's a, a guy that was a pastor. His name was Joe Bailey, uh, and he's now uh, gone to be with the Lord. He had a son named Tim that apparently was a real rebel rouser and so forth. And so at a point in time, as his young, early adult life was going on, he gave him the boot and said, listen, if you're under my roof, these are the rules, da 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 da, -da. you're not going to follow them, you're out of here. I'm a pastor, I'm not going to stand for unrighteousness in my own home. I love you, but you're gone. And uh, so he kicks his, his son out. Not an easy thing to do. His uh, son moves uh, nearby, Wheaton, Illinois, and rents a house with, uh, <laughs> with his son telling the story later, a group of musicians and so forth. And then late one night, <laughs> as the uh, months uh, go by, uh, Joe, the dad, gets a phone call. He says, uh, sir, this is the police. Your son's been arrested on drug charges, and we have him here in jail. You know, the, the, the nightmare, you know, comes 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 calling. Uh, it's two o'clock in the morning, jumps out of, out of bed, runs down to the local police precinct, uh, goes there, son's not there. Uh, goes to by the near one, uh, son's not there. It goes a little further away, it's not there. They have no record of him being in jail. Now he's really concerned. So he, he drives to the apartment where he knows Tim's lives and he goes to the front door, it's unlocked. So he goes in, again, it's the uh, middle of the night. Uh, goes, not that bedroom, oh, not that bedroom, goes into his, finds his son. He's there sleeping in the bedroom. And he just uh, gets down on his knees and he, he shakes him and, and, uh, uh, and everything. And he says, Tim, Tim, I, I got a phone call that said that you, you'd been ar arrested on drug charges and everything. He says, no, I'm just, <laughs> I'm just sleeping here. What, what's up, Dad? You look pretty frantic. So, well, 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 yeah, I'm pretty frantic. I, you know, I got this phone call in the middle of the night saying you've been arrested on drug charges. No, just, just sleeping here, Dad. And he says, Dad's still pretty shook up. He says, well, well, let me pray for you. So he prays for him, kisses him, tells him he, <laughs> he loves him. He's kind of relieved, but just like, what's going on here? Drives, drives home. Ne they never knew who, where the phone call came from. Uh, never. 
Uh, it wasn't a prank. It wasn't a friend. It wasn't nothing. It was just a phone call out of nowhere. But uh, his son did not come to faith in Christ right there on the spot and all worked out. But later he did. Later he did. And he pastors a church in Indiana now. And this is what he says uh, later to his dad. He says, you remember that night when you got a, a call that I was in jail? He says, dad, I'll never forget you kneeling next to my bed, kissing me and telling me that you loved me. And then he said, then, then I understood the heart of God. You're willing to kick me out for righteousness sake, but you're also willing to come down here in the middle of the night, look all over the place until you found me. That's what brought him back to the Lord. See, and that, that's really what this, this chapter here is about. It's about the drasticness of how radical hell, the reality of hell is, but yet the heart of God in the midst of that. So verse 11, you should write it in your Bibles, it's supposed to be there. He came to seek and to save that was lost. Again, Matthew's gospel is all about presenting Jesus as the king and as the Messiah, but certainly the main underlining point of is why he came as the king, as the Messiah, to save sinners and bring us to heaven.